today on Mother Mayhem. What kind of relationship do you want with your mom now? If you could draw the line and set the parameters, what do you want it to be? Given who your mom is, how she moves through the world, what she's capable of, what she isn't capable of, and what kind of relationship do you want? Hi, welcome back to Mother Mayhem, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Podcast for daughters and sometimes sons. That's right, everyone. Today we have our first listener submitted question from a dude. (laughs) We're going to be welcoming Luke to the show. I named our listener Luke for the poor dude surrounded by women who talked and drank coffee nonstop on Gilmore Girls. So hi, Luke, and welcome. And also because you're here, thanks for offering me the opportunity to clarify why I made this show specifically for daughters in the first place. It certainly wasn't to leave out the sons or to imply in any way that they have an easier time with narcissism than daughters do or that their pain doesn't matter. I just did it to rein in the show topic a little bit to help the search engines find it, and because my experience was in offering therapy to women, and it far exceeds the amount of experience I have offering therapy to men, and I wanted to make sure that I represented myself and my expertise fairly and accurately. So speaking of search engines and whatnot, all of you, I could really use your help in getting other people to find the show. I'm a therapist and I have my own private practice and I started this podcast as a passion project, but that means I don't have the time for marketing it or pushing it out to more people. I've largely been relying on those search engines inside of the podcast apps to get the show in front of the right people. And if you're interested, here are a few ways you could help me get the word out and expand our mayhem community. And I honestly, I'd be so appreciative if you would take the time and consider doing so. So first, if you haven't already, please do leave a review of the show and follow the show in your podcast app. Those algorithms follow that listener behavior when they're deciding which shows they're going to recommend. They also really seem to be paying attention to when a show or an episode of the show gets shared from the podcast app. So if you have connected particularly with the show or with a certain episode of the show, sharing that episode personally with friends or on social media would really be helpful. And I know that can be hard to recommend this show in particularly publicly because it outs you and it shares something that you might not be prepared to share. And if that is true for you, let it be true for you and allow the show to be something that is just yours and just for you. I don't want any of you abandoning yourselves just to help me to get the word out about the conversation. I would never choose that for you, and I would never ask that for you. Only do this if it's an easy thing for you to do or to give. And also, if any of you happen to be in any of those groups that are on Facebook or Reddit or anything like that where you talk about being the child of a narcissist, if you wouldn't mind sharing a link to the show there too, That is another easy way that can help us get the word out and reach more people. And right now, it's just Clark and I manning this ship, so anything you can do to help us out would be so appreciated. All right, Luke, it's you and me. We're going to chat. So Luke wrote in with his question. Here's what he had to say, and I'm going to find all of you on the other side. He wrote, I adore the podcast, and it's played a massive role in my last couple of months homework and therapy. I was actually wondering if you'd feel up to presenting an episode more on birth order than gender. A lot of resources I find focus on roles like the golden child, scapegoat, or lost child. And I was hoping for some coping mechanisms and perspective on being all of those roles simultaneously because I'm the only child. 
I've done an immense amount of work on myself, working on my self-worth, my picker for relationships, focusing on who I am, and all of that over the last couple of years. The thing to which I keep returning is the various roles and the immense pressure placed upon me as the only child. Mind you, there's a ton of pressure regarding procreation. I'm 37. I've decided it isn't happening. And there has been a seismic shift in my mom's behavior. And it's followed a major discussion where I reveal that I have no desire or intention to have children. I'm happy to expand further, though I figure generalities are best as you seem to fill in the patterns and mechanisms for coping and coming to terms quite well. If more context is necessary or a particular story, please just ask. Okay, Luke, I think you just about heard this like collective shout out from listeners thanking you for raising this question. I know I've touched on both sides of this equation in previous episodes, whether you're the only child or whether or not you and your siblings have different experiences but have been raised in the same family. This dynamic you're mentioning here, being the golden child, the lost child, the scapegoat, and all of the others does come with a lot of confusion and a lot of pressure. And I have a feeling, Luke, that even when the child of a narcissist has siblings, they can often feel like at any point in time, they move from being the golden child to being the scapegoat. And being the child of a narcissist is lonely regardless. Some siblings are able to talk to other siblings about it. Some siblings end up fighting with each other about it. And some are like you, and they simply wish they had somebody to talk to about it because they're the only child. And sometimes they even wish they just had somebody to fight with about it. Navigating the trauma that comes from being the only child of a narcissist is specific. You don't mention whether or not you're also the only child of a single mom, but that experience is also filled with a pain that can be really nuanced as well. I'm going to do my best here to speak to that also, because it's really clear to me that you feel alone in this. So even if you have a dad, your question makes me think that he may not be entirely involved and that a lot of this still falls on you. So perhaps like other listeners who've shared their stories, he's also an enabler of your mom and has become one more person that you end up being in tension with around these issues. I want to remind you that this is really hard to talk about. This is an episode where I am going to be talking about so many awful things that narcissistic mothers can say or do. And it is unlikely that I am going to get through this episode without a single person relating or feeling like I'm talking about them. This is the shit that narcissists do. These are the main tools in their toolbox. So, of course, I'm going to be offering tools on managing all of it and navigating all of it. But first, I do have to break it down. And hearing it broken down can be dysregulating. It can make your body react as you remember what it felt like and has felt like and can still feel like. This is a trauma recovery show. And we talk about trauma here. So I'm going to trust you all to take care of yourselves, to take breaks if you need to, to walk away, to stop listening, to take a pass on this particular episode if it isn't your day. If these shows are dysregulating for you, but you want to be able to listen and to better understand, you can always ask a friend to listen with you, or you can ask a friend to check in with you after you listen. Sometimes you can get some psychological distance by approaching it as a student and taking notes, or you might need to remind your trauma brains, yes, we're talking about hard things here. But I am capable of talking about hard things. And yes, it's okay. I've got this. You might need to consciously invite wise mind to sit with you. You might need to imagine your current self holding the hand of your inner child. You get the point. Set yourselves up for success to listen to this safely and be okay with it if today just isn't your day for this conversation. So we're going to dig in. 
I first want to do this quick recap of the different roles and pressures that narcissists can put their kids in. And I want to offer quick descriptors of each of those so that we're all using the same language and have the same understanding around this. Some of these roles are roles that your narcissistic mother may have assigned to you. And that will, of course, be a trauma for you. As you're experiencing Luke, it will be something that you will have to work through, confront, and heal from. However, there are other roles that children themselves end up developing as a coping response to narcissistic parenting. And I want to use this opportunity to address those things here as well. Because assuming a role in a family, even if it wasn't assigned to you, is part of surviving narcissistic child abuse, and it is a normal response to trauma, and you might need help, and you might need my help, and reassigning those roles away from yourselves as well. So first up, the golden child. (laughs) Shout out to my sister on this one. Hi, sis. The golden child is the favored child. They've been praised. They receive special treatment. They're used as the example that other children are compared to. Golden children may have been shielded from criticism, but underneath there's often this intense implied pressure to keep being perfect, to not disappoint. There can be real or implied threats to the golden child. For those of you with siblings, you might hear, now you don't want to turn into your brother, do you? Only children can sometimes be threatened with outright abandonment if they don't keep up with that facade of perfection. Golden children are often put on display and they're bragged about. They're treated as extensions of the narcissistic parent and not as their own selves. So as a result, what ends up happening is golden children often fail to develop a sense of identity or no who they are without their mother telling them who they are. We kind of heard that a little bit last week with Brenda. And of course, no one is perfect. We all are going to make mistakes and there's nowhere to go but down once you've been put on that pedestal. And the higher you rise, the higher you fall, and the more it's going to hurt when you land. And also, that expression about it being lonely at the top, it's true here too. The higher you're placed, the further away you were placed from everyone else and everything else. So that makes connection really hard. It can create these weird, intense relationships with your mom because you haven't been allowed to connect with other people. And then others end up being seen as far too ordinary for you. And I want to be clear here. Being a golden child is also a trauma. You may have been revered and your siblings and your other family members might not see it or validate it because in their minds and in their experiences, being revered seems a hell of a lot better than being treated like shit. From my perspective, all of this is being treated like shit. All of it is awful, sad, and packed full of trauma. Next up, we have the scapegoat. Now, if you spent any time as the scapegoat in the family, you are the reason why anything and everything went wrong and why everyone couldn't get along. You were told you screwed it up on the regular, that you'd never amount to anything, and that you didn't deserve anything good. All of that is obviously, and of course, incredibly isolating and ostracizing. When you were alienated with messages of not being worthy or not being enough, and you're an only child, that often leaves you feeling utterly and hopelessly alone within this echo chamber of her words reverberating in your head. If you had siblings and you were the scapegoat, you were ostracized with them too, but you might have experienced it a little bit differently. Your mom's words and treatment of you likely kept you separate from your siblings. Your siblings may have been threatened by your mother to not talk to you unless they wanted to end up just like you. As a result, your siblings may have distanced themselves from you lest they fall out of favor with your mother. And you might have known that. Intellectually, you might have even gotten it on some level that of course they can't be in relationship with me because mom would annihilate them. 
but also being the scapegoat meant your mother didn't choose you. And likely, if this is happening successfully, your father didn't choose you either. And now your siblings don't choose you. Repeated rejections make for repeated traumas. And all of this is going to make connecting, relating, and attaching as an adult incredibly painful and difficult to navigate. All of it is very hard. I see you guys on this, and I feel it. I want to talk now about something we haven't yet dug into on this show, and that's the role that you, as the children of narcissists, would sometimes assign yourselves as a way of coping and protecting yourselves. And I have to be honest here, I hate this conversation. I try to avoid it like the plague because it's a really hard one to have without trauma survivors feeling like they're being blamed for their own suffering. And I understand it's really hard when maladaptive behaviors are described as your coping responses. And when I say this, many of you are going to hear that you did it wrong. What I wish you would hear and what I hope you hear is that you did the very best you could with the tools you had at the time. That of course you tried to do things and take on roles to protect yourself from more abuse and from more trauma. And of course you did that. And how very good it is for all of you that you did that. That was your trauma brain protecting you. Trauma brain had your back and protected you from things you couldn't have possibly handled otherwise. That was you saving your own life at the time. And some of you might have lives now where those roles you took on are old and tired and they're no longer serving you. Some are still in the thick of it with your narcissistic mothers and you still need that cloak of protection. Wherever you find yourself in this conversation, it's okay. Let me be clear. What are we talking about here? I am talking about how, as a way of coping, some of you might have taken on what we might call the lost child role. Lost children are typically quiet, withdrawn, and avoid conflict. Some of you found some semblance of peace for doing that, while others might have been rewarded with some graciousness from your mother. Regardless, you often became invisible in the family, either unintentionally or intentionally, but being forgotten, even if you try to go unnoticed yourself, is always going to be considered to be a trauma. Not being involved in conflict never means that you weren't traumatized by conflict or by the threat of it if you ever became difficult. Some of you may have taken on the role of what they call like the mascot or the clown in your family. Sometimes I, all these different names that they throw up there in narcissistic abuse recovery really feel obnoxious to me and makes it feel like to me that like more problems are getting added to your plate. But I also think that naming things and making them identifiable makes it easier to raise your hand and say, this is me. If you identify as being the mascot or the clown, you may have diffused the tension by calling attention to yourself, by being the one-man band or the circus in the family. The problem with this is that while you were making everyone laugh, you weren't being taken seriously. And as a result, you likely ended up feeling a bit lost yourself. Then we have the hero or the high achiever of the family. Now, if you identify with this, you might have tried to stay outside of the fray in an attempt to avoid trauma. You might have tried to be the best and to always do your best. You were likely overachievers. Also, you were the ones who pinned all of your hopes on getting out with your success and your achievements. But then once you got out, habit took over and you found yourselves always running from yourselves, trying to catch the next mile marker, lest it all fall down like a house of cards. Lastly, here we have the enabler. We have a whole episode on the enabling dads, but kids can take on that role too, especially only children. 
because they have no other choice. No one is coming to save them, so the only thing they can do is try to keep the peace. And of course they might try to do this by supporting their mother's behavior, ignoring problems, or actively participating in the dysfunction. Many enablers find themselves out of options, but what I'm hoping you all see in this sort of deliberate and intentional outline of all of this is that all of you were out of options. You all did the very best you could with what you had at the time. So Luke, your experience as an only child likely meant that you were like a chameleon, trying to shape shift into whatever was needed on any given day. So that meant maybe one day you were the clown. And then sometimes you needed to be awesome at everything so that your mom could feel good about herself. And then other times you had to be her punching bag taking on whatever she was dishing out because there were so few others to take the blow. So that means in adulthood, you're probably on some level still doing that or even just feeling compelled and thinking about doing that. Now, it's clear you've done a lot of work before writing into the show and you may have already begun setting some boundaries with her, but what you're fighting is a decades-long habit of considering your mother of being aware of her, considering your reactions to her, and trying to cut her off at the past by anticipating what she's going to need or how she might respond to something. So much of your life has been in consideration of her. It can be hard to feel like that you can stop considering her when you're the only child. It can feel like there is no one else who could hold the ball. Here's what your wise mind already knows. Siblings, no siblings. Only child, family of 12. You do not owe your mother a life of service, a presence in her adult life, caretaking, or a relationship. You were not told as a kid that you matter. Your existence wasn't valued as anything other than as an extension of your mother, so it can be hard to see yourself as separate from her. Also, let's be honest here. You might still have some love for your mom, regardless of how much she hurt you. I think that's like a quiet part that we forget to say out loud sometimes in these conversations. So let me be clear here. You do not owe your mother your love. You do not owe her your life. If you feel nothing but anger and resentment toward her, that's okay. Sometimes your mothers are just all bad and lack any redeeming qualities. However, narcissistic moms really can build an illusion of a bond, especially when she's made you an extension of herself. If you've been attached and connected to your mom all your life, sure, you might be enmeshed and programmed into being attached to her, but also you might genuinely be attached and genuinely love her. And it is okay to love your narcissistic mom. Two things can be true. She can be narcissistic and you can still love her. Loving your mom, caring about her, Worrying about her doesn't mean that you are doing trauma recovery wrong. And you're not doing it wrong if you hate her, want to see her dead, or want nothing to do with her. There is no feeling you can have toward your mom or about your mom that is wrong. They're just your feelings, and whatever they are, they're yours and they're right. So what the fuck do we do about all of this, right? First, so we're all going to settle in. We're going to take one of those good old-fashioned deep breaths I like to go on about because this is a lot. And next, we try to get you clear with yourself about what it is you genuinely want. What kind of relationship do you want with your mom now? If you could draw the line and set the parameters, what do you want it to be? Given who your mom is, how she moves through the world, what she's capable of, what she isn't capable of, and what kind of relationship do you want? 
how responsible do you want to be? Where does she end? Where do you begin? I would spend some time thinking about that, and I would spend some time writing that one out. I'm doing a lot of journal coaching lately for somebody who doesn't actually advocate for journaling as much as other therapists tend to. But here's the thing also, Luke, you asked for coping strategies, and I really do think coping is important. But here's what I also hear when I hear that request for coping strategies. I hear a request for reacting strategies. I hear, Heather, my mom is batshit crazy, and I'm all alone in this. I feel responsible for her and obligated to be there for her because if I'm not, no one else will be. So please help me be there for her without losing my own ever-loving goddamn mind. (laughs) Help me not be upset, Heather. Help me not care. Help me create distance. Help me not feel what I'm feeling. That is what I hear a lot of times, Luke, when people ask me for coping strategies. This is what I need you to hear. You get in control of your coping by getting in the driver's seat of all of this. You have taken the driver's seat in a lot of the parts of your life. I hear a lot of places where there's self-ownership and self-acceptance, but on this, because it might leave your mom unsupported, you're feeling more hesitant and more careful. But you have come to trust your picker. You have come to trust that you don't want kids. You have come to trust that your therapy is putting you in the right direction and on the right path. You feel so strongly about it that you are even able to lay claim to it with your mom despite how she might react or not react. So if you've done it in all of these places, Luke, you probably know your own mind here too. It just hurts. And it's scary. It fucking hurts because of course it does. And of course it's fucking scary. This shit is exhausting. And you have been dealing with it your whole life. And if I had to guess, you've largely been dealing with it alone. So your mom might have ostracized you from any extended family. Or perhaps extended family ended up seeking distance from your mom. And then as a result, they ended up being distant from you too. Step one is to give yourself permission to know your own mind and know your own truth. Step two is to give yourself permission to be inconvenient for your mother. Step three is getting clear on who you need to be and how you need to move through the world in order to be the guy who redefines his relationship with his mom to be closer to what he wants, even if it's something that's further away from what she wants. This, my friend, is about giving yourself permission to hurt her and disappoint her. And as I walk you through this, Luke, you might be thinking, I know my heart, Heather. I know I don't want to leave. I don't want a distance. I just don't want her to be able to hurt me. I want to be able to be in relationship with her without her being able to wreck me. First step there, you gotta own that one too. That too gets to be your choice. As soon as you consciously make that choice, you are no longer trapped. You have looked at all of the options. You know you can leave and you are choosing not to. She's not keeping you there. You are. You have looked at your values, at what's important to you, and you have decided that figuring out a way to maintain this relationship with your mom is what's important to you. You're not trapped. You're not the victim. You have chosen this because it's a reflection of who you are and what's important to you. Now, everyone with us in this conversation knows that is a really hard choice. It means accepting that your mom is who she is. She's never going to change. She cannot meet your needs. And it means finding a place to live with the grief. And it also means finding a place to put it down so you can be in relationship with her. That path might require a little bit of trial and error on your part. 
trying some things and seeing how they worked for you, how they felt for you. It might mean navigating how close you want to be and risking getting too close and then needing to back away. You just might be curious and open to finding out what works for you and what meets your expectation of yourself and the hopes that you have for yourself and your relationship with your mom. It's also a really good idea to check in on your boundaries and limits and anything that might need to be communicated to her. Then you spend some time thinking about what kind of supports you might need in order to navigate an ongoing relationship with your mom. How are you going to release the energy that comes from being in contact with her? Where are you going to put the sad, the mad, the frustrated feelings that come up? How are you going to make staying connected to your mom work for you so that you can keep your sanity and your heart in check and also protect it? Tools you've already learned in therapy are going to be really good for you here, and you might need to work out with your therapist a few more. And also, you might end up needing a coping plan for when you're in contact with her and a decompression plan for after you've been in contact with her. What do you need to make this work for you? And then you allow yourself to have it. It might be mindfulness exercises, meditation, working out, journaling, long walks, good sleep, healthy eating, and connections with the supportive people come to mind right off the top of my head. But also, so does allowing yourself pleasure, allowing yourself the things you like, and allowing yourself to say yes to yourself. It also occurs to me a little bit here that you might need to give yourself permission to change your mind. I would encourage you to regularly check in with yourself, to periodically re-choose this relationship so that you are able to stay in the driver's seat of that choice, so that if she does something wildly inappropriate, you don't feel trapped into staying. You always get to re-choose. You get to decide at any point in time that this is not how you want the next chapter of your life to go, and you are allowed to choose differently. This is true if she gets old, if her health fails, if she becomes worse. What's going on with her is not the deciding factor for you with this. This is about what you want. You wanting something you not wanting something, you having more time, less time, more stress, less stress, whatever it is that is going on in your life that makes you want to make a change is reason enough to make that change. (laughs) Can you tell I'm climbing onto my soapbox here? I'm getting comfy. (laughs) You say yes, you say when, you say where, and you get to say stop. Beginning middle, and full stop. (laughs) That's me from my soapbox. Luke, thank you so much for showing up for this show. Thank you for being vulnerable and willing to ask me for help, even though I named that that help is for daughters. And thanks for waiting so darn long for my reply to this. I know you've been waiting for months. I got in the weeds and with all the letters, and I'm really sorry about that. I appreciate you so much for being such a loyal listener. I know I've gotten a couple of notes from you in my inbox. And also, I just got to tell you, Luke, you're not the only dude. We have husbands of wives listening. We have the dads of daughters listening to better understand. And of course, we have other sons too, who just like you got swept up in all of this and are trying to find their way too. All of you listening are in this together, and you've come from all over the world. Guys, Estonia, Romania, Italy, Czech Republic, Trinidad, all of those are the countries that popped up in my podcast stats this week. And Clark gets the stats on the show, too, in her inbox, and she wants you all to know that Canada, too, has some crazy mothers. So both of us are in it with you. All of you are in it together. And yeah, in it with you. Bye for now. I'm so grateful that you're here. 
you're right where you're supposed to be. At its heart, I'm hoping to use this show to build the community of women working together to heal from childhoods marked by maternal narcissism and emotional neglect. My goal for Mother Mayhem is that this show becomes an advice and mentoring-driven show where you share your questions, struggles, and stories, and I offer you direction for healing and recovery. That can't happen without your contributions. I invite you to send a recorded voice memo or write in an email with your questions and things you're struggling with. You can always find me over at heather at daughtersnpd.com. To connect further, I invite you to find me over at Instagram and occasionally on TikTok at Daughters NPD. If you know another woman who needs this conversation in her life, I'm going to ask that you share the show with her. You can help me get the word out with your reviews and social shares of the show, and I hope you'll consider doing so. Special thanks to Heather Clark for editing this show. She's in my head and knows what I meant to say when the words come out backwards. Thanks for your time today. I'm always in it with you. Bye for now.